Let's pay homage to the lineage gurus. Homage to the venerable Mang Liang Ming. Homage to Master Sakya Zheng Kong. Homage to His Holiness the Sixteenth Kamapa. And homage to Master Dukden Dorji. Homage to the Three Jewels of the Altar. Homage to the main deity of the group practice tonight. From the Eastern Lapis Lazuli realm, the Vaisaya Guru Medicine Atakata. Sunu Tanchen Katsu Dutan City. All Dharma Masters, Dharma Educators, Dharma Teachers, Dharma Instructors, Dharma Tutors, Directors, and all disciples present here and over the internet. Good evening, everyone. How do you do? みんな、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、頑張る。新作、
were eradicated. And I hope that Medicine Buddha not only helped me, but also helped the illnesses of all beings and alleviate them. Because illnesses is of all the sufferings, we should we can say that being sick is the most suffering. I saw many ill people, sick people coming to see me or when I go to the hospital I see many patients and I felt very grieved seeing them so that's called Oh, you, it's between life and death. You don't want. You want to die, but you can't, and you want to live, and you can't either. So sometimes, when you're sick, you can't even die, even if you want to. That's why the Buddha has said that human life is suffering, and this is also one of the sufferings. I hope that Medicine Tathagata would be compassionate towards sentient beings, and by your vow, radiate lapis lazuli light and salvage and help sentient beings who are sick, or the sick sentient beings. Things in this world, sometimes things are not absolute. And Buddha Dharma, the key is the most important fundamental wisdom is absolute. The fundamental wisdom of Buddha Dharma is absolute, and this only exists in Buddhism and not other religions. And this is what is extraordinary about Buddha Dharma. Pay attention to this, because generally speaking, in the Saha world, everything is relative. That, but the highest kind of wisdom of Tathagata, having Buddha Dharma, that's absolute. That's why we often mention the absolute truth or the Dharma seal, and they are the absolute. This is a joke, but it's really not quite a joke. It said here, a doctor was talking about something. He said, the inventor of treadmill died at 54. The inventor of gymnastics 
died at 57. Uh, the bodybuilding champion died at 41. World champion. Bodybuilding. And uh, the best football player Maradona died at 60. However, the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken died at 94. And the manufacturer of cigarettes, Winston, died at 102. Uh, the creator of opium died during an earthquake and at 116 years old. <laughs> Hennessy, the XO. <laughs> Hennessy XO. Uh, inventor died at 98. So these doctors, why do these doctors uh, conclude that exercise can extend lifespan? Look at the rabbits. The bunnies always jump around, but they only live to be in for two years. And the turtles never move, and they live to be 400. Therefore, nothing is absolute. Just calm down. Eat, drink, and enjoy life. But it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, eventually you will die. <laughs> The end doesn't matter what you decide, you will die. So, this is what the doctor said. Uh, the doctor talk to the friend. The friend asked, Doctor, is it true that exercise can extend lifespan? And the doctor said, No, don't waste time on exercising. Everything will end by uh, uh, speeding the heartbeats will not let you live longer. So just like if you drive faster, will it extend the lifespan of the car? If you want to live longer, you should take afternoon naps. And the friend asks again, should we decrease our intake of alcohol? And the doctor said, not necessarily. You know, uh, wines and brandies are made from fruits, and the beers from grains. And how about fried, deep fried food? And the doctor said, as long as you don't use chemical or additive oil or vegetable. So if you use vegetable oil, wouldn't that, is there anything bad about it? How about chocolate? And the doctor laughed. Cocoa beans? Fine, as long as you don't add sugar. And how about swimming? Is it beneficial to our figure? And the doctor replied, If swimming is good for your figure, how do you explain the whales? 
这个人问：色道自己的体型重要吗 ？How about body sculpting? Is it important? And the doctor replied, "Actually, round is also a kind of figure." Lastly, the doctors sum up, Mister. Human life should not just one way journey toward the uh the tomb, but you should live with one hand holding beer, one hand holding chocolate. When you have used up your body, tired, and then you can cry it out, oh, I've lived a good life, and just eat whatever you like, because eventually you will still die. Don't be cheated by the motivational motivational speakers. That's what the doctor said. Therefore, in this world, it's not necessarily absolute. People say that lemon is very good for your body. Like you place a slice of lemon in water, it's good, but not for me. Every time I drink a lemon water, I will definitely uh, diuretic, like I would uh, urinate it. For you, it's fine, right? But for me, it's problematic. It acts as a diuretic for me. So if you offer me water, just give me water, plain water, and don't add lemon in it. Because if you do, then I would uh, excrete even all the breakfast, lunch, and everything. That's my body disposition, composition, uh, disposition. Everybody's different. Everybody has their own body, so nothing is absolute. So what I meant is that only Buddha Dharma is absolute. Nothing else. The rest is not absolute. Now we will talk about the main topic, a question from Malaysia. A question by Luo Huaguo. Malaysian disciple Huaguo pay homage to the Guru Buddha. My question is on the body severance practice of magic lap drawing. Grandmaster at the Taiwan Lezang Temple in 2019, during the magic lap drawn grand homa ceremony, Grandmaster imported magic lap drawn deity practice, the body severe practice and the black wrathful dakini. You said that by receiving the empowerment, you can practice this dharma practices. However, all the masters, reference disciples who did not come won't be able to practice them unless you go to Seattle and personally receive the empowerments. However, in the book, Living Buddha Lian Sung's Pith Instructions, you wrote another kind of body severance practice that Guru Padmasambhava imported to Grandmaster. 
三遍, First, you reset the mantra for visualizing the emptiness three times. Visualize one's body to become like Mount Mary. The right eye soars to become a sun disk. And the left eye soars to become a moon disk hanging in the sky. The blood in the body becomes rivers for the sentient beings to consume and utilize. The skin and flesh are offered to the sentient beings in the six samsaric realms to consume and utilize. Everything inside the body transforms into nothingness. Guru Padma Sambhava said, the one who can forsake their own body has immeasurable loving kindness and compassion. They have bodhicitta and they endowed with great vows and great conduct. I, living Buddha Lian Sung, frequently visualize this. And I state, the body severe practice is the foundation of the bodhicitta or the bodhisattvas in the great vehicle. My question is, do we also need an empowerment Personally, for this body surveillance practice of Guru Padma Sambhava, if we need to receive the empowerment personally, then people who would like to practice the six preliminaries would not be able to perform the body surveillance Dharma practice. This body surveillance practice of Majiklap Drawn. Actually, and the Bodhisattva's practice uh, imported by Guru Padma Sava to Grandmaster. Magic Lab Drones, Bodhisattva's practice is a cutting practice. It belongs to cutting. So you offer your whole body and mind. That's a tremendous vow. You completely offer your whole body to the sentient beings in the six sleepless realms and all the beings in the ten Dharma realms. So magic lab drones, body surveillance practice is extremely important, a great dharma. Because magic lab drone is also her past life was Ishijogar. So Guru Padma Sambhava's Buddha mother, Ishijoga, later transformed or reincarnated as Majiklapdron. And Majiklapdron was also a disciple of Bodhidharma. Majiklapdron had several gurus. And the cutting Dharma practice also belongs to Zen Buddhism. Zen is also a cutting Dharma. So we don't talk about the Dharma itself, but we can say that it is a complete offering of body and mind. It's a method to completely offer or to offer the body and mind completely. About the Dharma that Guru Padma Sambhava transmitted to Grandmaster in the book, Living Buddha Lian Seng's Fifth Instructions, there's also a body surveillance practice. And his question is, do we need a in-person empowerment for this Dharma practice? Now let me ask all of you. Can it be done remotely? 
or does it have to be in person? <laughs> Maybe I should just ask Guru Padma Sambhava. When I was seated here just now, several times I was in meditation and I heard someone was speaking behind me. Not in the front, that, that would be you, right? But that's from my back, behind me. And someone said, Look, Grandmaster Lu was about to fall asleep. <laughs> when I heard that statement, I woke up. And to this evening, it was very special. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas really cared for me. And they said three times. Oh, they said that I was about to fall asleep. And good, I didn't fall asleep today, right? The ones behind me told me, oh, they're about to fall asleep. He's about to fall asleep. And so I was awakened. So they reminded me, don't think that they are, they are all alive, really. Very clear, very soft, but it's right into your ears and very clear. So now I would directly ask Guru Padma Sambhava. Please guide whether the body severance practice that you transmitted would need an in-person empowerment. Please say so. If not, you just say no need. Okay, it's resolved. Guru Padma Sambhava said, no need. See, nothing is absolute. Some need in-person empowerments and some can be done remotely. So nothing is absolute. Let me share a joke. The ones who explain clear things into and make it unclear is called ex an expert. But those who explain things that's unclear to make them clear, that's called masters. But it doesn't matter what, how you explain, it's still unclear, that's called elderly. But in Chinese, they kind of rhyme. A woman is driving, and the tire, they had and she had a flat tire, and she sent a text to her dad. I have a flat tire, Dad. And the Dad replied, Why didn't you call your boyfriend first? And the daughter replied, He didn't receive my call. Okay. Do you have a spare? And the daughter replied, He didn't <laughs> accept the phone either. <laughs> The wife had a dog since last month, 
and other than the typical commands, she always let the dog sniff the money. And the husband asked, why are you teaching him to, to pick money from the streets? And that was the wife just smiled and didn't say anything. And a few days later, all the husband's personal savings are gone. Now we'll get on to the main subject. Uh, 37 enlightening factors are the pure land of the Bodhisattvas. When a Bodhisattva becomes a Buddha, sentient beings with mindfulness, right exertion, transcendent travel, roots, powers, realization, and path which this field. So I've talked about this last week. So maybe when you read this, you would not understand what is this. You know, mindfulness, right exertions, transcendental travel, roots, power, sensation, and past. They are all 37 enlightening factors. They are the four mindfulness, four right exertions, four transcendent travel, five roots, five powers, seven realization, and eight paths. And people who practice this will be reborn in this pure land. Sentient beings who are born in Amitabha's Sukhavati pure land are all practicing the 37 enlightening factors. We have talked about the four mindfulness last time. I was going to say that you can just check on your own. This uh, in the Buddhist uh, books, and it's very com can be found easily in the Buddhist uh, dictionaries and things. However, I feel that it wouldn't be good not to talk about it. So today I will talk about the four exertion. The first one, there are four kinds of exertion. The first one, let me first talk about the first one. If you have bad thoughts, you need to cut them off. That's the first kind of diligence or exertion. When you have a bad thought, you need to observe your own mind and immediately cut them off. Second, you don't have a bad thought, but you still need, you have observed that the bad thought does not arise, and you don't want it to arise. You should have such mindfulness. That's the second exertion, the third one. You don't have good thoughts generated, and you need to generate good thoughts. And the fourth one, when the good thoughts are generated, you want to increase and extend them. These are the four right exertions. When a bad thought appears, you need to cut it off. And before it arises, you don't want it to arise. Next, you need to generate good thought. 
And not only that, you want to continually enhance and increase it. These are the four right exertions. They seem simple, but they're not. They're actually very difficult. Our thoughts sometimes are uncontrollable. You can't control them. You say that you can control yourself. No. People cannot control themselves sometimes. So what is good, what is bad? What is virtuous, what is evil? They are uh, opposites. Buddha Dharma at the highest realm is absolute. In the Saha world, they are all pairs of opposites. When there's good, there's bad. A simply, simple example. In my Dharma practice, uh, throughout the Dharma practice, in the offering to the ghosts and gods, I would chant uh, the golden winged bird, Garuda, all the gods and ghosts in the wilderness, Raksasas and Hariti. May you be filled with this nectar, and then you would form this Vajra finger, and you draw a home character on the surface of water, and the water becomes home water. And the Garuda, ghosts and gods in the wilderness, Raksasas and Hariti, may you be filled with sweet nectar. And this has become nectar. And then you sprinkle them, sprinkle it to make offering to the Garuda, Raksasas, Hariti, and the gods and ghosts in the wilderness. May they be filled with the nectar. Every time I chanted, I've said this, every time I chanted Garuda, a bad thought appeared in the past. <laughs> I would thought of an arrow that shot at the Garuda, and the Garuda would die from it. Strange. I had no... Uh, uh, no, uh, anything bad with the Garuda, I don't know, but every time I visualize Garuda, then a thought would appear to of an arrow shooting the Garuda and killed it. So that's not an offering, that's killing, that's bad. So I often chant his mantra. That's the, his mantra. But Garuda, the golden wheat bird, I don't know, did, why did I have that thought? I don't know, I couldn't control it. Just an arrow shooting at the Garuda. And then I tried many ways to eradicate the thought, to stop such a bad thought. And then later, I found a way. Do you know that in the Congress in America, in the United States, there's a bird, right? With the claws holding two arrows, right? Is that the case? That the claws are holding two arrows. So I transformed my thought. The arrows were shot, but the Garuda caught it and held in, with his claws, so that's not a bad thought, because the Garuda caught it, and so the offering worked. So therefore, you have to 
cut off your bad thoughts. If you cannot, you transform them. Like an airplane was in an accident, a plane crash, and nobody died. None of the passengers died. Did you ever have a thought that why didn't they die? Did you? No? Some people do. Because only when they die, like the whole plane, then that would be a big news. Otherwise, a plane crashed without anybody dying. That's no big news. Some people have such a thought. For example, the war between Russia and Ukraine. What is good, what is bad? Which side is good, which side is bad? It's impossible to decide. Many people, many countries side with Ukraine, but there are also people who side with Russia. So, which one is good, which one is bad? Some people, do you ever have such a thought? I don't like that person. I remember we had a disciple before, and he said, every time I see that person, I really despise him, and I really wanted to bite him by the piece of flesh of him. Did such a thought ever occur to you? There used to be a disciple who said that. Actually, that person was unrelated to him. Just somehow, just dislike him so much that he wanted to bite him. Uh, we often say romantic enemies, and you would have such a thought, that person is my rom enemies in romance, and you have thoughts uh, appearing like maybe he should have an accident or something. Did you ever have such a thought? Nobody dared to raise their hands. <laughs> There are many bad thoughts appearing, many, about killing, about stealing, and you see good stuff, and you feel like just taking it for you, for yourself. And something. Uh, mental rape? Have you ever had such a thought? Of course, you wouldn't admit it. You rape in your mind. Of course, you said no. But according to psychologists, or experts about desires, that every person in the, throughout the day, they would have some fantasies about sex, and they must need a target or several targets objects of your fantasy. So is that uh, violation, is there a crime mentally? Mental crime? Is there a mental crime? 
都称为，就算是恶吧。So, 好的念头的就是善吧。So those with bad thoughts are bad, and those with good thoughts are good. And it is still quite difficult to cut off the bad thoughts. And to generate good thoughts, you need training, a period of training. And moreover, you need to continue to enhance and extend the good thoughts. And these are the four right exertions. You know, let me tell you, once you master the four right exertions and continually do those, in the least you will not fall into the three lower realms and you will go to the heavenly realms. It's not the highest wisdom of the Tathagata. It's not the absolute, however. Although it's not of the highest kind of wisdom of the Tathagata, at least you can go to the heavenly realms. By practicing the four right exertions, you can go to the heavens. You can eradicate all the bad and enhance all the good. And these are called the four right exertions, and you need to be able to do this. Now, do you understand? There's a question there. Thank you, Grand Master, for explaining the four right exertions of the 37 enlightening factors. So it's the path that helps us to extend suffering, to enhance the good thoughts. If you have bad thoughts, you cut them off. And if you don't have bad thoughts, you want to prevent it. So this is actually related to the five skandhas, things that you see, wealth, money, you give and give a little bit more. You give to the Lotus Light Charity Society. So uh, those people that have not mentioned, you want to give them. That's about material things and feelings. You give them good feelings every day, your wives, spouses, relatives. And so more good feelings, which is what Grandma said, love, then give more. If you're not used to it, that if you don't know to show this to your spouse, then you need to do it. And in conduct, that you need to do more, that you do good, then you, have, you want to carry more coins. Maybe you give one today, you want to give five tomorrow, or maybe you will give bills. And then the consciousness, you need to be responsible for yourself. Most of your thoughts are bad. Nobody knows. Like what you just said, it's just a thought. So perceptions are a thought. Sensations, perceptions, volitions, thinking and consciousness. So all this four, stop the bad one, prevent the bad thoughts to arise, generate the good ones, continue and enhance the good ones, and you need to keep reminding yourself to do it all the time, and to remember them all the time, and this is something that Grandma is teaching us to do.
Very good. Thank you very much. This is the four right exertions. This is very important. People who live in the Saha world, we want to be a good person. In the Bible, it said that you want to be a, a good person, which is to perform these four right exertions. So the good ones go to heaven and the bad ones fall into hell. So the Holy Bible said that you want to be a righteous person. And in the Buddhist sutras, we talk about good and bad, virtuous and evil. You want to in increase the good ones and to stop the bad ones. And the next one is the four uh, divine power. What is this? Transcendent travel. But in the Buddhist trust, that's like feet. So divine feet, what is that? So a person has a thought and that belongs to the head and they have a body and the, the feet are the ones that's holding up a person. It's the power to hold a person up. <coughs> So the four divine powers actually refer to the four meditations because only by having meditative stability you can hold up. The Buddhist sutras often talk about divine feet or transcendental power. So actually that's meditative stability the power to hold it up. The first one, anybody knows this four? The ambassador again. Mind. Desire. Uh, the meditation of desire, why do we say that? Because when we meditate, we should meditate through what we like. That would be easier to enter meditation. So desire, bliss, and meditation. So if you, have, if you like something, you use this desire to enter meditation. Let me give you a simple example. If you like the sound of flowing water, when you meditate, you listen to the sound of flowing water. And you remember that sound. You love that sound. Just by listening to the sound of flowing water, you would meditate on that sound. You would focus and concentrate on it. And this is called desire defined feet. Most people will not be able to explain this. Why do you still have desire in meditation? Because you cannot do it without 
that desire. Like if you like the smell of incense, sandalwood, then you burn in incense and sit quietly, and the smell of that incense, you feel peace and light. So utilizing the fragrance of the sandalwood that you enter meditation, that's called divine feet through desire. So let me tell you, whatever you like, you make use of it, like what you see. You visualize the compassionate face of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva because you like to see Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. Whichever Bodhisattva's face that you like, you continually visualize that face and enter meditation accordingly. This is called divine feet through desire. Many people cannot explain this. As long as you can meditate, that's good. So you meditate on the incense, you meditate by listening to the flowing water, and your mind concentrate on the sound. This is the first kind. Because you have such likings, like if you like a certain music, then you can enter meditation by listening to that music. This is it. So in Tantrayana, there is a very special meditation that's called meditation through desire and bliss. Whatever that makes you most blissful, you make use of it to enter meditation. That's called meditation through desire and bliss. Uh, that's too deep. What about the first level, second, third, fourth level of meditation? That's why I will talk about the divine feet through desire. Whatever you like, you utilize it to enter meditation. Then you will be able to enter meditation and get it. And there's a special meditation in Tantrayana called meditation through desire and bliss. And that's not simple at all. Actually, let me tell you. It's a very high realm in Tantrayana that's not to be practiced by most people. It's called consul if you can be in that realm, and through that bliss you can enter meditation, if you can, if you cannot, then it would be impossible for you to practice it. If you like that, but can you use it to enter meditation? No, not necessarily. I'm not uh, telling you or asking you to practice that meditation. Because if you try, you would fall. There would be a downfall for you because this kind of meditation is the hardest and it's the highest kind of realm, a very high kind of realm, that you can enter meditation in such a state. The difference between meditation and sleep is sleep is 
in the state of complete sleep, but meditation is on one point. You're still awake, but not completely awake. There's that song in between sleep and awake wakefulness. So have sleep and have awake, that's meditation. So meditation is different from sleep. So this is divine feet through desire. So you enter meditation through a certain thing. Can you practice it? Can you master it, anyone? Huh? I I can't hear, hear it. Oh, How about entering meditation by chanting mantra? Yeah. If you like to chant mantra, you chant the mantra until entering meditation. Yes, that's right. You can. Meditation of extinction is a very high realm. You have no afflictions, no attachment, nothing at all. It is to find someone without affliction and attachment completely. It's extremely, extremely rare to find a person without afflictions and attachments. Was that the Xu Yun, the Venerable Elder Xu Yun? Yes, he should be able to reach such a meditation. He was beaten by two of his disciples, and he was in meditation. That's why he could be reborn into Shita and to listen to the Dharma taught by Maitreya Bodhisattva. He was beaten until he fainted. So why don't you try it? The master beat you with the pole until you faint, and then your soul, you have no more afflictions, right? After you faint, and you have no more attachments, then your soul flies to Tushita heaven and meet Maitreya Bodhisattva, and then you come back and tell me what you see. Uh, the Venerable Elder Xu Yun had this in his mind to want it to go to Maitreya Bodhisattva. So when he was beaten or stricken by his disciples, his soul went to Maitreya Bodhisattva and to Shita Heaven because his heart and mind was with the Maitreya Bodhisattva. That's why he went there. So this is also because of what he is liking in his heart and mind. He had a very high meditative ability. We all know about Xu Yun, Venerable Elder Xu Yun. Uh, he went to the mountain Tai, and at the foot of the mountain, he was cooking a mushroom. 
and then while waiting for it to cook, he was entering meditation. And then when he exit from the samadhi, the fire is gone and the mushroom has a small deer already. Just imagine how long that it was. So there was such an anecdote about him. So this uh, meditation through extinction, we don't know how long he'd been meditating. So he was cooking. And the food, and then when he got out from meditation, the fire is gone and the food is moldy. So the diligence, divine food, is you train yourself, train your own meditation every day. So in between sleep and wakefulness, and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas behind me told me he's about to fall asleep. So between sleep and wakefulness, I heard a voice. They told me that Master Lu is about to fall asleep. So I can hear very clearly several times. Think about it. So to be diligent in practicing meditation is called diligent, a divine feat through diligence. If to be diligent in your meditation, if to enter meditation through what you like is the first one, and the third one is divine feet through thoughts. Thoughts are endless. Sentient beings in the Saha world have ever-flowing, incessant thoughts, continually. So flowing continually, thousands of them. One thought after another, after another, after another, endlessly. So about the divine feet <laughs> through thoughts, some people said, like after one thought passed, just before the next thought arises, and then when you meditate in that gap, that's a true meditation. So between one thought that's been gone and the other thought that's not rising yet, that's meditation. Some people explain it that way, but as for me, just watch the thoughts one after another after another. Observe them, but you don't record them. You don't remind, remember them, and you don't follow your thoughts. You just let them flow. You know a thought after a thought arise, but and you don't remember them, and don't you record them. Just like watching flowing water, let them flow. And you don't want to place your mind on those thoughts either. 
then you naturally would be in meditation. That kind of meditation is called thought divine feet. Divine feet through thoughts. And the fourth one, the highest one, is the divine feet through wisdom is the meditation through the fundamental wisdom. That dharma or everything has no self-nature. Everything is an aggregate. Actually, once you uh, dissect them, they're all empty. Like the atom. You can say, Wisdom divine feet belongs to the wisdom of true emptiness. When you enter the highest realm, it's the meditation of extinction. Everything is empty. There is no true existence. Everything is empty. No true existences, existences, and your bodies disappear. All external forms and phenomena disappear. Your body and mind are abandoned. Actually, there are no bodies and minds to abandon either. And you know that this is the meditation through the wisdom of emptiness or the fundamental wisdom and that's called divine feet through wisdom. Even the body, my mind are gone. Houses disappear, all material things disappear and you merge with the cosmic space, with the sky. And this is the fourth kind of meditation. Divine feet through wisdom. This is the absolute meditation, the highest. Oh, no. Oh, Xiu Xing, this is The Four Noble Truths belong to the second adulation. The meditation of extinction is the absolute. So from the relativities to the absolute, and you can realize to the highest kind of wisdom, non-returning, only bodhisattvas of the eighth ground and above can practice the wisdom divine feet. You can use this divine feet through wisdom to eliminate your illnesses. Why? Sometimes when you're sick, like Master Lian Teng, he got a lung cancer. And lung cancer is very painful. But he never took any painkillers. The whole hospital, there was a sensation at the hospital because everybody knew that would be painful. But with all the tubes, he was still seated on the bed meditating. He got 
so he got lung cancers, which is the most painful. And during the most painful period, he was still seated on his sick bed with all the needles around on him, meditating. That's why Ji had someone called Sijunzi. He or she saw the Dharma body of Master Lian Deng radiating light all over and said that he's a great Bodhisattva. So Master Lian Deng, the a master of True Buddha School, who received Ci Zhenzi from Ci Ji's praise, that's Master Lian Deng. In his meditation, when he was really sick and in great pain, still able to meditate, and after he passed away, Ci Zhenzi saw his Dharma body radiating bright light, very compassionate, just like a Buddhist and Bodhisattvas. Master Lian Deng. Oh, the Buddha asked Ananda to get some water to alleviate his illness. But when Ananda got to the river, there were 500 merchants passing by, and the water in the Ganges River was very uh, turbid, so he did not get any water. Actually, Sakyamuni Buddha asked him to do it, but he did not follow. Therefore, that's why the Buddha entered into Parinirvana. Actually, Sakyamuni Buddha, before leaving the world, he had, uh, we can say, uh, dysentery, diarrhea, uh, severe diarrhea, so he was dehydrated. If had he been given some water, he, may, he might have be able to extend his lifespan but, and ask Ananda to get water, but Ananda did not get any water. And nobody else beseeched the Buddha to stay in the Sahawa. Therefore, Sakyamuni Buddha entered into the meditation of extinction. That's also meditation of extinction. So today we talk about the right, four right exertions and the four divine feet. Thank you. Tomorrow I will continue.